I'm glad my wife's not in here at the moment. Can you guys hear me? Am I good? Okay, sorry. Uh, I, I told myself I wasn't going to do this. Um, just wanted to thank everyone uh, for the prayers recently. Uh, we had a miscarriage, I'm sure everybody heard. I just want to really thank everybody. Uh, your prayers really mean a difference. It honestly does. So I uh, just want to thank you guys from the bottom of our hearts. Uh, today we're going to talk about choices. We're going to talk about life choices, uh, where we are with our families. We're going to look at a man of God who was probably one of the most successful men in the Bible. We're going to look at some of the choices he made uh, and how they've affected us, affected his children. Uh, I hope that this would encourage and challenge you today. In my own life, I've been able to, to look at, take its moment and look back at the things I've done. Uh, when I look at Adeline and see how she's growing, and it was just yesterday I was looking through all the videos of her crawling and laughing and, and walking, those first, first steps. Uh, everybody always tells me, I still remember when, Adeline was, when Jessica was pregnant with Adeline, everybody always says, it goes by so fast. Just take, take advantage of the time. I recently spoke with a man on a job site. Uh, he has two older children, and then I had another one like 10 years later, one of those oops moments. And he said, now that he's older and they have a seven-year-old, he doesn't work as much. He spends the time with his children. The other two are gone. They're out of the house. But now he knows to take the time with his children. He's, he's learned to appreciate every moment, to take those opportunities. And, and we've spent a good long while talking about this. Um, and still, like I said, everybody's always telling me. Um, I find myself saying it. To every other, I don't know what it is, we always feel like we can, you see somebody who's got a baby, the Craigers or the Rutherfords, and you say, hey, Thomas, right now you're holding that baby. Enjoy that, because it's going to go by so fast. And it does. It really does. Um, everything we do affects our children. Everything. Everything we're, we talk about, everything we do, everything we say, it truly doesn't affect our children. Um, if you're here today and you say, I don't have any children, I'm not married, your choices today will still affect your future children. The habits you make today are going to be habits that you're going to carry on. You can look at your parents. It doesn't matter how old you are. I know for myself, there's things I've seen in my father's life that I said, I'm not going to do that. That's not going to be the person I am. Uh, for one, my dad used to get road rage pretty bad. He'd get pretty upset when he's driving. Somebody's not driving very well. Um, I can confess to you guys, that's probably one of the worst things that I do. I get so frustrated when somebody's in front of me or, you know, doing something. And it's just, I had a conversation with my dad the other day. And I said, you know, I got that from you. And it hit me. He said, yeah, I don't do that anymore because he has high blood pressure. And he almost, he actually had a stroke. You know, there's consequences for our actions, for the choices we make. Um, and I never thought about any physical problems that could happen, anything that could happen to me because I'm frustrated with somebody else driving. Um, it really spoke into my heart uh, on, on how the things that I do can affect my daughter. Because even at her age right now, she sees me, she sees dad. If I'm driving and somebody's right behind me, if I start saying something, she hears that. Um, for instance, we have two cats, Milo and Isabel, two little cats. Uh, I don't know if you guys have cats. If we have food out, the cats will jump up and they want to get into it. And I'm the first one to get after them. Say, sissy, no. Yeah, they call them sissy or bubba. I don't know why people give their cats and pets multiple nicknames, but... We do, anyways. So I was sitting yelling, sissy, no. And then before you know it, she's be the next day or something, my cat's just laying there on the beanbag, just hanging out by herself, and Adeline just go up to her, sissy, no, no. It didn't even do anything, you know. Um, we can see the effect that we have on our children, even at a young age. Um, I'm sure everyone here as a child has seen their kids do something that they did that they didn't wish they had done in front of their children. And you can't take those things back. We're all very busy. Um, we all work eight, ten hour days, most of us. We get up, we have a routine. I know myself, I'm the kind of person, if I go shopping, I can go to Aldi and Walmart, get a whole car full of groceries and be home in an hour. Because I make a list, I want to go in, I get what I want, and I'm out. Matter of fact, my wife used to work at Aldi. She'll even, if she makes a list, she'll put in order of the things in the store because she knows where they're at. So I can go right down the aisles, grab my stuff and go home. It's just how I'm programmed, I like it. But in those moments, if I'm, I'm realizing if I'm in a hurry through life, 
through these eight and 10 hour days that I'm off at work. I come home, got to cook dinner. I got to do all these things. If I'm always constantly in a hurry, what am I missing? I really feel the Lord's been telling me to slow down lately. And I believe he would tell each of us to take a look at our lives and how we're spending our time, especially with our children, what we're doing alone when nobody's watching because it makes a difference. The things we do make a difference every day. We're going to start today with the story of David. Uh, King David is kind of right in the middle of everything. Uh, descendant of Adam. Later, Jesus is a descendant of David. He starts off son of Jesse. He was a shepherd, uh, youngest in his family, um, kind of looked over. We know that David ends up uh, becoming a great musician. He plays the harp. I can only imagine how talented David must have been because if you notice, I've never seen a harp on a stage at a worship. I'm sure it's really hard to play. I can't even strum a guitar. I can't imagine what it's like to strum a harp. He would strum the harp and sing for David when David had a spirit come on and the spirit would leave. David was a warrior and a mighty conqueror. He slew the Philistine, Goliath. He was almost 10 feet tall and all of Israel was afraid of. He was admired by many. Very well-respected man, inspired writer. David wrote many of the psalms that we see today, many of the worship songs that we have and the hymnals. They're inspired from David's writings and the man that he was, his love for God. That's why we are able, a lot of times, to have the songs we worship. He's changed just almost everything. If it wasn't for David, the choices he made, I don't think we would have worship like we do. I really don't. When David was around 30 years old, he was anointed and he became king. Of, became a king. It was about 40 years total that he reigned over Israel. Uh, David even united the 12 tribes of Israel. They were not all together in this time. So this man had a lot of talents. Uh, it'd be easy to say that David was very successful in his professional life. There wasn't much more that he could do. Uh, the whole kingdom loved him. Everybody loved David. He was a man after God's own heart. But in David's personal life, there was another story. David was obviously a very busy man as king. Um, we see that David had eight wives. He had 19 sons that were named, that were living, and one daughter. So you can imagine how busy David's household must have been. I'm sure that uh, certain kids were easily swept over, you know, looked, didn't, didn't really notice how, how could a person have that much time with as many things as he had going on. Now, I know most of us probably don't play a harp. I don't know if anybody here plays a harp or is a mighty warrior, can uh, wield a sword, um, I know we may have some authors here, but uh, I think a lot of us can really get with David in his humanness, and how he was human. David made mistakes, even though in days to come, Jesus himself would be known as son of David. Um, I don't believe anybody else in the Bible shared the honor that, uh, that David had, that he has now. But in his family, David had some problems. You know, David was a passionate man. He loved the Lord with all his heart. I'm sure he loved Israel, loved his children, loved his family. But David also loved women. He had a passion for women. And at times, this got the better of him. I, mean, I honestly believe that God never, never planned for David to marry more than one woman. Um, Any time in the Bible, if you look through the whole Old Testament and the New Testament front to back, uh, any time that a man married more than one woman, there was strife in the home. You can look at Abraham and his wives, and we still see the problems today from his children. God put up with it, but I definitely don't believe that that was part of God's plan. I believe that each of us have personal integrity. I believe David had personal integrity in that he, in his heart, loved the Lord, and if he could have went back, he probably would have done things differently. I think a lot of the times we believe certain things, but based upon our feelings, on where we are on that current time of the day, or whatever's going on, we don't take the time to think. And today I'm just urging you to really think about your actions as you're living your life, as you're going from the day-to-day -day things, as you're busy. 
Think about what you're doing. There's certain things that we, had, we do that we can't take back. You just can't unscramble certain eggs. And once they're done, they're done. A lot of these decisions that we make, we think really aren't affecting anyone else. But the truth is, they are. They're affecting our own lives. Um, recently, I seen a, a post from Terry Crews. I don't know if you guys know who he is. Successful actor. Uh, four children, a wife. Uh, the man had come out and he had a pornography addiction. Now, why would a man who's successful in the eye of the public come out and speak against this? Speak how, hard, how it harmed his family, how he almost lost his family. It's because it had. There was, he was by himself. He thought, this isn't probably hurting anyone. But it destroyed him on the inside. His, his passions destroyed him because he didn't choose to say no. One of King David's greatest choices that, uh, that he made that would affect him, his legacy, his children, was with Bathsheba. We're going to start in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 2. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent somewhere to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. David was a man who no doubt could have whatever he wanted. Uriah was a friend of his. He was a loyal soldier to him. He wasn't just another man in his army. There was one thing that David should, knew he should not have, and it's another man's wife. He knew that. It's the same sin that started in the Garden of Eden. You can have all these things, but of that tree, you cannot have. And he decided to take from it. In a moment, he didn't think about it. He didn't take the time to think. He didn't stop and seek wise counsel. After this, uh, David found out that Bathsheba was pregnant. And to cover up his sin from his shame, and because of who he was, he tried to have Uriah go and sleep with his own wife. That way the baby could be passed off as his own son or daughter. When Uriah refused, because he was an honorable man and they were at a time of war, David sent him out to have him murdered on the battlefield or to his murder. Soon after, seven days after the baby was born, well, David had married his wife. Uh, Bathsheba took, him, took her as his wife. They lost the baby. We see the immediate consequences of David lying with another man's wife. The problem is it doesn't stop there. The sin continued on. It affected his family in ways that he never could have imagined. In a moment's pleasure of trying to fulfill a desire in which our society always tells us, you have the right. You're not hurting anyone. If you want to do it, do it. David said, okay. Instead of taking the time to think, and he paid for it dearly. David was no doubt busy to go back to his family, a big home, lots of children, lots of women in the house. I can't imagine having more, more than one woman in a house. I'm sure my wife would not want more than one man in the house, so just to be fair. 19 boys. I know a lot of you guys have big families. I've been around the Smizer house, and they got three boys. And it's like, vroom, 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 he hit me and this and that. I cannot imagine 19 boys. I'm sure it's fun, but we're going to move on to 13, chapter 13, a page over. Continue. David's eldest son, Amnon. In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Amnon became so obsessed with his sister Tamar that he made himself ill. I'm not going to go into all the details of this, but pretty much what happened was Amnon seen the same thing that David seen. He no doubt was allowed to have whatever he wanted, being the firstborn son, which they normally were allowed to, especially in that day. You know, everything was theirs. You know, he was the son of a king. No doubt the kingdom was going to go to him. He probably had no doubt in his mind. The one thing he knew he couldn't have was his sister, who was beautiful. He came up with a plan with his cousin to get 
Tamar in his room. He feigned ill and she came and he took her against her will. Direct sin of David, of his lust, is now passed on to his son. Granted, David's not responsible for his son's sins, but he made the example. His son made the choice. And that's not David's fault, but David did lead the example. And what we lead our children is where they will follow. There are certain things people don't unhear or unsee. Whether, of course, David never planned his children to follow this path, but no doubt they all knew about it. After all, Bathsheba was his wife now. She lived, probably lived right in the same home. There was little or no consequences to Amnon once David found out. His sister was desolate. She was broken, of course, completely shamed. She went to her brother, Absalom, her full-blown brother, um, and went to him. Absalom, of course, was angry with his father. After two years, Absalom proceeded to get his brother, Amnon, out and had him murdered. We see a direct parallel to David having Uriah murdered to cover up his sin, and now Absalom has murdered his own brother in vengeance over his sin. After this, Absalom had fled to Gesher, which is the home of his mother, for three years because he had murdered his brother. After two years, he was able to return, return home, and it was, or after two more years, excuse me, he was able to see his father finally. He had to sit, he was at home for two years without being able to see his own father. Absalom then rose up in rebellion against his father because no doubt his father wasn't there. He thought he could do it better. Most of us, when we have a problem, we always think we can do something better. He thought he could be king. And David, through all his grief and everything that had going on, he must have kind of lacked in his kingly duties. He wasn't there for his servants, for those in the kingdom that needed him. It took about four years, Absalom was working, to steal the hearts of the Israelites, always trying to get their favor. He then proclaimed himself king. David fled the city. And here's where the story gets interesting. Absalom receives counsel to sleep with Dave, 12 of David's concubines on the roof of the palace. The person he receives the counsel from is from Ahithophel. Ahithophel is Bathsheba's grandfather. And this is the same place that David first laid eyes on Bathsheba on the roof of the palace. David's sins have followed him through his children years later and have now affected him, caused him heartbreak. No doubt war came up. Thousands of lives were lost due to this. His children, home was broken all out of a moment's passion. David's example has hurt his family. You may never sleep with someone outside of marriage. You may not have these issues. And I hope you don't. But the little things, the little compromises do make a difference in your life and in mine, in your children's, in your grandchildren's. We never know what we're doing and how it's going to affect someone. It may seem innocent, but it's not. It never is. Sin never only affects one person. It affects everybody, everybody around you, especially your children, your families. Later in battle, Absalom is killed. In 2 Samuel 18, a few pages over, verse 33. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. How heartbroken David must have been to want to give his own life for his son, even after everything he had done. He still loved his child, no doubt. I'm sure Absalom wished that his father had been around a little more. If he would just live for him a little bit, he wouldn't have had to wish he had died for him. We know that David repented of his sin with Bathsheba and that he was restored. But there's still consequences for his sin. The things that had been done couldn't be undone. David was brought back. He was restored. 
We know in Romans 8.28, and all things work for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. David was definitely called. He was God's king. He was the one that, that God was waiting for to become king of Israel, not Saul. Uh, and we know through David's bloodline, the son of Jesus would be born. Unfortunately, as we've said, there is consequences. So about a month ago, my daughter, Alan, um, we're potty training, so I would appreciate some prayers over that. That's fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you guys all remember that, who, who have children. Um, it was bedtime, and another struggle with children. For those of you who don't have children, it's a fun time. When, she's got, when it's time bedtime, she wants to go potty four times. During the day, she doesn't want to go potty at all. So well, I take her potty, and I'm literally sitting on a stool in front of the toilet, right in front of her. I could grab her and hold her with my arms. I'm on my phone, reading the Word of God, because through the PTS training, we're pretty busy, so I'm trying to, anytime I rock her, go to bed, I'm normally reading, and I wasn't looking. Um, kind of funny. Uh, we're sitting here talking about how I mentioned there's certain things we want, and we want to go after it. I didn't realize this until this morning. My daughter seen something she wanted, and she went after it. She was sitting around on the toilet, reached over, fell and hit her head on the tub. All her weight went. She looked like she got in a boxing match with Josiah. She had a big old, or just swollen. Um, she started screaming. I thought immediately, oh, she's fine, she's fine. My wife grabs her, you know, realized she's probably not okay. And then Adam was so worked up, she started throwing up everywhere. And my wife's freaking out, and she's carrying her around the house, and there's throw up going everywhere. So I thought I'd share that, because <laughs> why not? But uh, it wasn't until a little on later on I realized that my daughter may have seriously been hurt because I wasn't paying attention. I missed it. She could have hurt her neck. She could have a concussion. I stayed up with her. For a few more hours after to make sure she was fine. She was. It was hard for me to fall asleep. When I woke up, first thing I did is I checked on her, made sure she was breathing. You know, I remember crying out to the Lord that night, just praying that my daughter would be okay. That it wouldn't be because of my choice of me not paying attention. That she'd be fine. And she was. It's even the small things, though, that can affect us. I believe the Lord would have us take a moment and look at our lives. Just slow down. Don't be in such a hurry. We've all got things we've got to get done. But what are we missing along the way? What opportunities has the Lord have for us that we can speak into somebody's life? We can help our children. We can implant those things that are going to make a difference. Yesterday I had the privilege of praying with two men. They were father and son. To see his son pray for his father pray for me, and to go both ways. That was an example. And I hope he passed on his children. That's what we need in this nation. Pastor Marty's talking about how we need this nation. It's right here. It's in our homes is where this is going to start. It's not going to be because of some political office. Although King David, if he would run for office, I would vote for him. Could you imagine it? King David, man of God, versus Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to see what he'd have to say about that. I got a pretty good idea I know what would happen if he opened his mouth. There'd be some repercussions. But anywho. David's own son, Absalom, died hanging from a tree. His hair was caught. About 1,500 years later, the son of David, Jesus Christ, would also die on a tree hung from a tree, not because of his own sin, but because of your sin and mine. Today we have a choice. Jesus is there. He's waiting to meet you, to take away your hurt, your pain, your struggle. He wants you to trust him. All he says is, bend thy knee. We get the choice. It's either his will or ours. He'll let us have our will. He's okay with that. He's already offered the way. He's finished the work. We get to choose. The one thing we don't get to choose 
is the consequences. Life or death. Everything we do makes a difference. Everything we do here makes a difference. Worship team, if you would, please come. John Paul II, he was the Pope, I believe it was about 2005, he is no longer the Pope. He was quoted saying, as the family goes, so goes the nation, and so goes the whole world in which we live. Today, in your home is where it starts. It starts with me, it starts with my home, with my heart. If you don't know Jesus today, that's definitely the first step. It's not going to be something hard. He's not going to ask for more than you can give. All he's asking for you to trust him. Just walk forward and meet Jesus. It's not about anybody else. Today I pray, if you are struggling in sin, deal with it. Don't wait another day. Your choice today can change everything. Your children are worth it. Their children are worth it. Our neighbors, our friends, our family, they're worth it. Even for yourself. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I just thank you for your love, Lord. Thank you for your Son. Thank you that you have made a way for us. Father, I pray, Lord, that we would be able to just take our eyes off ourselves and lay them at your feet, Lord. That we would just see you, Lord, just there for us turn to your word, Lord, to your truth. Father, help us, Lord. I know we just get in your way so often, Lord. It's our pride, Lord. Father, I just give my pride up to you today, Lord. I just pray that you would just come in this place, Lord. I just need you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.